Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you mind grabbing your Bibles and standing with me just for a moment? Thank you for all that is going on before this moment, all the way up to the sound room. Just watching all the work that they do and allowing us to see the words and and uh, hear the words that are spoken and sung. Thank you. Thank you again upstairs. Let's let's give a round of applause for all that. Thank you, Brother and Sister uh, Elder Rodriguez, for leading up the team for the church picnic yesterday. I appreciate all you did. A lot of work. There were so many people that helped. You just can't go down the list. You're going to forget somebody. But it was so nice to see everybody there yesterday. What a great time of fellowship and uh, food. That was nice. Jude chapter 1 since there's only one. I should have said Jude chapter 3, you know. Verse 3. Great to see all the visitors today. You're welcome here. We're so glad you're here. We pray that you feel the power and presence of God. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The Bible says, though we or an angel preach any other gospel other than that which I have received, let him be accursed. So it was only delivered once. Somebody comes to you and says, I have a brand new gospel. <laughs> it's not from Jesus. I promise you, because here it says it was delivered unto the saints. It was once delivered unto the saints. Now in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, and verse 7, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. If you know the story, you will know that God came in through the mouth, the actions of Moses and Aaron, and God said, let my people go through a bunch of plagues, ten plagues. God put pressure on the Egyptians who finally let the people of Israel go and they were delivered from the country and the people of Egypt. But it wasn't long after that we find them murmuring and grumbling. We find them also finally at the foot of Mount Sinai when Moses went up to get the tablets of stone. He went up to get the law from God. And by the time he came down, the people who were delivered the people of Israel who were delivered from Egypt were now dancing and lewd and lustful and immoral. So one deliverance was not enough. We read about the faith that was once delivered, but I want to talk about twice delivered. Twice delivered. Jesus, bless your word. Bless the power of your word. Thank you for your precious blood, which washes white as snow. Jesus, none of us in this room are perfect, ever will be. Not until that blessed day when the trumpet sounds and we are in your presence forever. We shall be like you, for we shall see you as you are. And we pray that you would touch us, Lord. Would you motivate us? Would you let your hands of potter be upon the clay, mold us and shape us, God, into something that is a vessel of honor, we pray. We ask for your touch in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Look at your neighbor and say, twice delivered. God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> There are those that moved to Egypt 
by choice. We find when Joseph was in Egypt, that's how the Israelites got there. Joseph was sent there as a slave. And when Joseph rose up through the ranks, second in charge to, to the Pharaoh, he ends up bringing his family into the country in the people of Egypt. But it was by choice. They made a choice to move to Egypt. But there are others that were born there. It's funny how Egypt, when you look it up, you, you can type in Google and you can find theologians. They all say that Egypt was a type of sin. Type meaning example, illustration, um, a mirror of sin. What does that mean? It means that you are locked into a place and you can't get out of your own power. You have to do things um, based upon somebody else's directive. You, are, you don't get to govern your schedule. You don't get to, to make decisions on your own. You, you are completely at the whim of somebody else that is over you. You are a slave. And that is what sin is like. You can't break away. You, you, no matter what you do, you can try to stop for a while, but it's got a hold of you. It's like you're in prison. So that's why they call it a type and foreshadow of sin. Egypt is. But we find, again, the example is that there are those that chose to go there, but there are others that were born there. When we look at the progression, uh, this was quite interesting to me as I studied it the last couple days that there were those that moved to Egypt. They chose to move there, and they died in Egypt. Others were born into it, but they stayed there, and they died there. In 430 years, there were at least, there were at least seven, eight, nine generations of people that were literally born there, they lived there, and they died there. So we had people who moved there and died. The Bible does say that all of Joseph and all of his generation, they died in Egypt. The people that moved there died there. But there were those that born, were born there. And they also were born and died in Egypt. Lastly, there were maybe three million that were born there, but they didn't stay there. They left Egypt and died somewhere other than Egypt. One of the stipulations to actually leave Egypt and not die in Egypt was the fact that they had to leave Egypt. Wow, that's profound. And yet, we think of Egypt as sin. There are people that literally move there. They make a choice to go to sin, and they die in sin. There are also us now. That was before. Now we are born in sin. That's what the Bible says, that everyone has sinned and, and, and come short of the glory of God. We are all born sinners, but there are people that are born in sin and they choose to die in sin. They don't want to leave Egypt. They stay there of their own choice. But there were at least 3 million approximately that were born in sin, but they got up one day and they said, I'm not going to stay in Egypt. I'm leaving Egypt. I don't want to die in Egypt. Just because of a Savior who died on Calvary, doesn't mean that we all leave Egypt. Just because Moses showed up on the doorstep of Pharaoh doesn't mean every one of the people of Israel are free. They had to make a decision. They had to gird up their loins. They had to do things to get ready to leave. They had to leave Egypt. They could not stay there and be saved. Spiritually, they were delivered from Egypt. They were delivered from a place. We can say that I was delivered from a place. There was a place in my life, there was a place in time where I was stuck in sin, addicted to all the immoral things that this world has to offer, but I was delivered from this place. But then they were delivered through the Red Sea. Notice they were delivered from a place. 
But then when they got to the Red Sea, they were no longer delivered from a place. They were already delivered from Egypt. But now, as Pharaoh and his army were approaching quickly, now they were delivered through the Red Sea. They were now delivered from a people. First, they were delivered from a place. But then they were delivered from a people. We can be delivered from a place in our lives, a, pla a dark place, a, 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 an addicted place, a place where we were struggling and wrapped up in the chains of sin. And we can say, praise God, I've been delivered. But it can't stop there. We ultimately also have to be delivered from a people people that will drag you back in you know pharaoh and his army they they didn't they didn't say you know you guys left without food you left without money you left, there's there's some things we want to help you know you don't have any protection we just want to help you know what they wanted to do they wanted to drag them back into the place where they were delivered from you can be delivered from a place but if you don't let go of some people in your life they're gonna pull you right back in so i want to be delivered from a place but i gotta be delivered from a people We get so stuck sometimes on saying, oh, praise God, I was saved. But salvation has to start by far more than just leaving Egypt. We need to be delivered from a people. But eventually, eventually they got caught up in sin at the foot of Mount Sinai. All of a sudden, the leader that led them out, somebody's going to lead you out of that place. And somebody is going to open up the Red Sea for you and say, you need to walk across this place on dry ground. And, and, and the Bible talks about the Red Sea as a type and foreshadow of baptism. For you were baptized unto the sea and unto the cloud. We all know that through teaching. But eventually, at the foot of Mount Sinai, there they are. They were delivered from a place. And then they were delivered from a people. You can blame a place if you want. You can say, well, I was, you know, I was born in the south side of Chicago. There's no way I was going to avoid drugs. So you can be delivered. You can move out of southern Chicago. And then you can be delivered from a people. You can say, come out from among them and be you separate. You can come out from people's influence. You can come out from, from the places that they go and the things that they say and the things that they do. You can come out from among them, but you're going to find yourself at the foot of Mount Sinai and there's still another decision that you have to make. So being delivered from a place and being delivered from a people isn't enough. They still had an opportunity and found themselves needing being delivered from sin. They were delivered from penalty. God's judgment was coming down upon them. And, and the man of God said, oh, God, oh, no, don't, don't, don't wipe them all out, God. Just, just please hold back. Just, you know, kill me. Kill me instead. Don't kill all of them. Go ahead and kill me. There's, there was a deliverance from the penalty of sin. Even though Israel, we look at the last plague, both Egypt and Israel were involved. Notice this. Some of those plagues only involved Egypt. God said, evil, I'm going to put pressure on you to let my people go. So God will put pressure sometimes on evil. It's not premeditated in a sense. It's, it's not, you know, once saved, always saved. But God will put pressure on evil to give you a chance to make a decision. Why? Otherwise, we'll just blame that. We'll blame evil and say, well, I was born that way. And, and it's the house I was brought up in. And it's the neighborhood. And, it's the pe and it was my dad. And it was my friends. And it was all their fault. And God will put pressure on them to say all right go now my question is whose fault is it now when God takes away the devil and he takes away all the influence there we stand and say I was delivered from a place I was delivered from a people but now I've got to be delivered from the penalty of sin Woo! oh God we get so used to saying I was saved 
My goodness, I'm thankful I was saved from a lot of stuff, but I am not yet saved from the influence of sin. That's got to happen every morning on my knees, every day when I open up the Word of God, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday, every Saturday, I've got to come and be delivered from the influence of sin. The last plague, notice this, even though, even though Israel was not exposed to all of them. They were exposed to, both Egypt and Israel were exposed to the firstborn was going to die unless. The firstborn was going to be killed unless. Unless they took the blood of a spotless lamb and applied it externally. They had to take that blood and they had to wipe it. They had to put it on the doorposts and the lentils of the home in which they live. This is our home. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost lives in you. You are a house. You are the temple of God. We need to take the blood and put it on the doorpost of our heart. We need to say nothing evil can enter in. I need to apply it. The fact that Jesus died on Calvary's cross doesn't apply the blood. The the only way to apply the blood is to go to the water. How do I know? Because the sacrifice was killed at the altar. And that priest took that sacrificial blood and he went to the laver of water and washed himself, which mingles the water with the blood. And then he took that blood and went into the holy and then the holy of holies and applied that blood to the mercy seat of God, which means the water was mixed with blood. When we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, the spotless lamb, was mingled with the water. It was a type and foreshadow. He's saying when you obey to the scripture that says to be baptized in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is applied to the outside of your life. And unless they allowed the blood to be applied to the outside... And the body of, of the lamb, the body, what did he say? Take the blood and put it on the outside. But he didn't stop there. He said, take the, the lamb and cook it, bake it. Put it on the grill. And when you get done, I want you to eat it. What is he saying? We have to eat the body and we have to apply the blood. That's the illustration. The only way you can apply the blood, it, because Jesus is no longer here, but we apply it through obedience, and it gets applied to the outside. But the only way to eat the lamb, the only way to get the lamb on the inside, what is the lamb? John said, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The only way to get the lamb on the inside is to receive his spirit. The Bible calls it the spirit of Christ. If you have not the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him, the New Testament says. We've got to have the lamb on the inside and the blood on the outside. If you want to leave Egypt, you can't do it without, without the blood applied. Even though Israel followed God's instruction regarding the body and the blood, they still had to leave Egypt. If somebody just, you know, hey, I was baptized and I applied the blood on the outside and I ate the lamb, but I like it here. They had to leave. The instruction was blood on the outside, lamb on the inside, and get out. I've seen all of it. I don't have to be baptized. Well, good luck with that one. The firstborn's going to die. Well, I don't have to eat the lamb. I don't need the Holy Ghost on the inside. Good luck with that one. You're going to die in Egypt. You may have been, oh God, you may have been born in Egypt. But the only way you're not going to die in Egypt is to put the blood on the outside and the lamb on the inside and get out. You got to get out of Egypt. Who God. Numbers 16, 20 says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. The people of Israel had sinned. Korah, the sins, they were coming against leadership. The rebellion was coming, and God said, Get away from them. I'm going to 
fizzle them out. Lightning, I'm going to open up the ground and swallow them. I'm, I'm so mad at them right now, I'm going to destroy them. And God said, separate yourself from evil. He said, Egypt, get out of Egypt. What did he say to the Old Testament? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. You can't live for God and be amongst evil. you got to get out of Egypt. God said, I am going to destroy evil. Either you get away from them or be destroyed with them. you got to, you can't stay in Egypt. you got to be baptized. you got to get the Holy Ghost. And you got to get out of Egypt. Get rid of the place. Get rid of the people. And get rid of the penalty of sin. They were delivered from Egypt. They blamed Egypt for their bondage. Once God delivered them from Egypt and were presented with another sinful opportunity, they needed delivered again. Have you ever, don't look at anybody, have you ever known anybody in your time coming to church, being saved, that struggled constantly with sin. It's just, it just seems every time you turn around, their life's a mess. They're addicted to something. They're falling into sin. You've got to go and bail them out of prison. You know, it, it's just one problem after another. And, and the problem is, is that they feel that once they have an encounter with Jesus Christ, they feel like everything's okay. It doesn't stop there. You can't just have an experience with him. You've got to be delivered from the place. Then you've got to be delivered from the people. Then you've got to be delivered from the penalty of sin. <laughs> Your flesh will take you right back because the problem is not external. They look at the chains on their wrists and on their feet, and they look at the stripes on their back as they're being whipped as slaves and the, the work that they had to do and the bricks that they had to make and the places they had to build and the, the authority that was abusive over their lives. They look at all of that, and they get set free, and they say, Woohoo! I'm saved. The problem is, is that that wasn't the problem. The problem is the reason they were there in the first place was because of their rebellion towards God. Notice this. This thought came to me yesterday. They didn't go to Egypt as slaves. They went there because God said, Joseph, you have been kind to me. You have been faithful to me. You have been so loyal and trustworthy and moral in your life. I am going to bless you. So I'm going to lift you up in leadership. And he brought his family to the land of Goshen, the choicest land in all of that area. So God brought his people there, not as a penalty, but as a blessing. God said, I want to bless you. And what does God do in our lives? God says, I'm bringing you to the church, not to place rules and restrictions. I want to bless you. But what do we do? We we say, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't like this. And the blessing turns into a curse. I got that from God. I didn't read that in a book somewhere. I looked, and I thought this whole process was God trying to bless the people. And when you try to receive the blessings of God with rebellion, it turns into a curse. It'd be better. He said, put a millstone around his neck and throw him in the sea. God, it'd be better if I was never born than to experience salvation and lose it. So to have, oh God, to have the blessings of God come my way and to turn my back on God, that blessing will become a curse. Egypt became a type and foreshadow of sin to the people of Israel. It was supposed to be a blessing. Because it's not external. It's inside. You ever have somebody, don't look at them. You ever have somebody, man, I just love Jesus. And all of a sudden you get them outside of church. They gossip, they cuss, they swear, they tell dirty stories. You look at them and you're like, 
What is that all about? The problem is they, they, they say the right things in church. They dress the right way. They clap their hands the right way, at least most of the time. You know, sometimes we get a little mixed up, but we're trying. It's a sincerity that's important. So we look like a Christian. We act like we can quote all the scriptures. But the problem is, is it's not external only. There's got to be, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever is in your heart will eventually come out. We, we get deceived by what's on the outside, but God says, I see what's on the inside. Then you can say, well, God looks at the heart. Yeah, but people see the outside. And if you get what's right on the inside, it will come out. God said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What is on the inside will come out to the outside. Jesus, so if you have evil on the inside, it will show up on the outside. You can fool everybody part of the time, but you can't all the time. But here's the good thing, and I finish up on a positive note on this part. If you have the Holy Ghost on the inside, it will show up on the outside. So you that say, oh, I just got to have the Holy Ghost on the inside. The outside doesn't matter. Wrong. Because I, what's on the inside will work its way to the outside, and we will give glory and honor to God. You, but does the Bible say you shall know them by their fruit? What does that mean? You'll know what kind of tree it is on the inside by what it produces on the outside. See, the Israel had it wrong. They thought it was all an external thing. If you can just, you know, I, I would serve God if I could just get out of Egypt. Well, they get out of Egypt, and they fall into sin again. Why? Because it's not just external. They, they put all the blame on the taskmaster of sin. And we can do the same thing and say, boy, if I could just get through this, boy, I'd serve God. I'd. God says, you know what? It's not, it's not just on the outside. It's on the inside. If you get me on the inside, that's when you're going to have the power to break away and stay away from sin. I read... I was looking at triggers. I've heard that many times. I've heard that in counseling. I've heard it by reading some psychologists. They talk about triggers uh, also with uh, conceal and carry triggers. Don't throw me under the bus yet. I'm... I, when I was looking up triggers, I, I was just doing some study on that. And basically, it's a circumstance which starts a process. A trigger is something that starts a certain process in flow, whether you talk psychologically, whether you talk sinfully, or whether you talk pistol-wise. It starts a process. Now, notice you have, you have the gun, but in the gun you have a trigger. And the trigger hits, the, the trigger has a hammer. It connects to the hammer. But the hammer has a hammer spring. And the hammer spring, once you pull it back, the hammer spring makes it go back forward. So without a spring, no good. Then this, the hammer goes and hits the firing pin. And the firing pin, once it is hit by the hammer, pushes forward and hits the bullet in the middle of that little, what do they call it? What's that? The middle of the bullet. Primer, thank you. It's the primer, but without the primer, it's no good, right? So you've got, all, you've got all those pieces, and you look, even though all the conditions are perfect for the gun to fire, you can have, you can have all those pieces, the trigger, the hammer, the hammer spring, the firing pin, the primer, and the bullet, or, or you can have all that in place, but without it being loaded. Without it being loaded, it's not going to hurt anybody. It can look like a gun. It can be a gun. It can have all those pieces. God help us today. A trigger. I've heard Dr. Hughes say, you know, a lot of sins in the church are started as a result of a trigger. A trigger. Yeah. You know, they have a weakness, and all of a sudden something happens in their life, and it starts a process. And that process flows right through until the fact that the person finally commits the sin that is against the word of God and against God. And I thought, God, all those pieces? But the truth is, even one of those pieces missing will stop that bullet from exiting the barrel of that gun.
We have a lot of opportunities. When sin presents itself to us, there's a lot of pieces. And when those pieces present itself, all we have to do is, 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 is make an effort to remove one of those pieces. And that gun is not going to fire. We can say, oh God, I just can't stop myself. I can't help myself. And God says, all you got to do is remove the, the, the hammer spring. Remove the firing pin. Remove the primer. Just get one of those pieces out of the process and it won't fire. The same thing happens with sin. Oh, I just, I just, I'm just not strong enough, God. I'm, I'm just weak, and I, I, it, it's just in my nature. And I was born that way. And God says, "You don't understand." There's one piece of the gun I didn't mention. There's a piece on a gun that even if it's got a bullet and a primer in it, if that piece is clicked in one certain direction, the gun's not going to go off. And that's called a there is a peace in, oh God, there's a peace in the process of sin. When someone pulls a trigger and the trigger hits the hammer and the hammer releases the hammer spring and it hits the firing pin, but the firing pin doesn't make its way to the primer because there's a switch called a safety. When sin comes after you and it tries to get the process of sin going, there's something called a safety that you got to have it clicked on. It's not going to fire. Everything can be in place for sin. But as long as the safety is set, it's not going to happen. Oh, God, help us to be aware of that process. Notice this in James 1, 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own life, lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Notice the process. Anywhere in this process, before the conception, before the primer is actually hit, there's all these stages that God gave us. And he's saying, there's a lot of opportunities. Sin is going to come your way. Temptation is going to draw you away. But there needs to be a safety. What is that safety? It's the word of God. It's the spirit of God. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the, oh, it's the church. We need to turn the safety on. I can't tell you how many times people have been in my office. Pastor, I'm really struggling with sin. You know what my question is? Is the safety on? I didn't say it that way then, but I will now. You know what my question is? Are you praying every day? I have never had somebody who has had repeated sin in their life come in my office and say, man, I'm praying an hour a day, Pastor. I never miss church, and, and I read my Bible 30 minutes a day, every day, and I submit myself to the Word of God. I've never had them come and say, man, I just can't leave sin. If you pray every day, and you read the Word of God every day, and you let the Spirit of God mold and shape you, there's the safety. I'm telling you, it won't matter what kind of temptation comes your way. The devil will keep pulling the trigger and nothing's going to happen. You're going to say, got the safety on. I got the safety on. You're never going to get to me. Galatians 5, this I say, then walk in the spirit. Notice these two scriptures. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Oh my goodness, wait a minute. I noticed something. What book is that? Galatians, written by Paul to the... Paul was writing to the church. He didn't say, hey, you sinners, get saved. He was writing to the saints, people that were already filled with the Holy Ghost, already baptized in Jesus' name. And he said, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. What's he saying? Trigger. Avoid the trigger. What is that? Just walk in the, in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, the lust 
won't have control over you. You'll have the safety on. Notice, you'll be delivered from self. The lust of yourself. I want this and I want that. God said, I'm going to put the safety on. Romans 13, 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What's he talking about? Triggers. He said, if you put Jesus on, you won't make provision for the flesh. Don't give yourself an opportunity. What's he saying? Don't put the bullet in the chamber. Or if it is for safety, put the safety on. Make sure that you, that you take precautions to put the safety on. Avoid the triggers. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 11 says, As a dog returneth to his vomit. That's quite illustrative. So a fool returneth to his folly. You don't want to know what that says in the message. <laughs> you know how we always, in the message it says, oh man. Returns. The problem is, is, the, is, 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 it's like he said, a fool keeps returning to his folly. Why? Because he doesn't learn how to put the safety on. He doesn't learn how to avoid the, the, the provision for the flesh. He doesn't, he doesn't learn how to, to, how to cause the flesh to be arrested by the power of the Holy Ghost. Egyptian control, it involved hard taskmasters, obedience or suffer, slavery, no individual decisions, no pay, no ability to worship as desired. Let my people go that they may go away and worship. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? God said, I want my people to worship, but I don't want them to worship it there. I want them to go outside of that evil city. Well, I'm just, I want God to save me just like I am, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm just going to stay in Egypt. And God said, no, I don't want my holiness tainted by the by the evil of that city he said you go outside the city and worship deliverance required what did deliverance require a desire to be free oh i just hate being addicted do you want to quit well maybe good luck i don't know that I, in 30 years i don't know i've ever seen anybody say you know i think i want to quit snorting cocaine i think and watch it happen. It just does. But, but every time I've seen somebody like Mike, like myself, come to the altar and say, I don't ever want to do that again. And I give you permission to do whatever it takes inside of me to take the desire for drugs out in a moment, in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, so to speak. That desire for drugs was gone, for alcohol, for cigarettes. No AA, no NA, no nothing A. It was gone. But we have got to have a desire to be free. There was also in Israel's situation, there was a message from God. Well, I can live for God on my own. Really? Good luck with that. God said, Israel, you want to be free? Yes. The cries came up from the hard taskmasters and said, oh God, we want to be free. God sent a man. God said, I will send a message. A leader has to be willing to respond. Miracles and pressure on the enemy. We need miracles, signs, and wonders to put pressure on on the enemy, and then there needed to be blood of a spotless lamb applied. The spotless lamb had to be eaten internally, and there had to be a willingness to leave Egypt. If we have that in our lives, all of those things, we can be completely and forever delivered from those addictions. In Exodus chapter 3, it says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. When God comes to deliver you, his intentions are not to put you under bondage. His intentions are to deliver you into a land of milk and honey. Would you stand with me? Sad thing, not long after they left, they wanted to go back. I thought of that. Complaining. God delivers them from Egypt. And we hear them through the book of Exodus. We hear them 
We don't have any water. You know, I think maybe God thought of that. We don't have any food. God has manna on its way. It'll feed us every day. Take twice as much before the Sabbath so that you have enough to eat on the Sabbath. God didn't want us to go out and, and collect on the Sabbath. We've got that covered. You know, I'd like some meat. Weren't you delivered from Egypt? Well, yeah, but that was a while ago. And, I, and what has God done for me lately? It, it's amazing how it's just the, the complaints keep coming. You find people that were completely delivered from drugs and alcohol and immoral sex and, and, and bondage and prison and all this stuff, and they come, I want some meat. And you're like, what did God do in your life? Well, I was, that was yesterday. You know, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to tonight. You, you, God, are we thankful for what God has done? Not long after they left, they wanted to go back. One of the, one of the things that they said, you know, we missed the, the garlic and the leeks and the fish. And, I mean, they just, it's, one thing I thought of when I studied that yesterday is these are people that were never free. These are people that were born in Egypt. So they never knew what it was like to be free. How about you and me, born in sin? never knowing what it's like to be free. We come into an apostolic truth kingdom of God. We come out of the Egypt. We're looking around and God provides living water. God provides the bread, the manna from heaven. And we go, Where, where's the meat? And, and, and we start complaining about this and about that. And, and, and we start saying, you know, you know I, I had it pretty good when I was in the world. I, you know, I was driving a sports car, and I had all the money. I, I had all. And we start thinking about what was back there. My question for people, they get so confused coming into the church because they look around and they go, man, you know, they, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't, they don't cuss and swear and tell dirty stuff. Man, I don't know if I can live like that. <laughs> what? Seriously? But we think these people are, there's no way I could be, I, there's no, there, these too many pages in here. There's no way I could follow this. That's what I said when I came in. But we get disillusioned and we start thinking, man, I, I, had, I had it better when I went back there. My question for you is this. Did you forget the whip on your back? Did you forget the long days with no pay? Did you forget the no decisions, the slavery? Did you forget all that? Oh, God. People eventually get weary of the wickedness of this world. They finally desire to be free. So they follow God's plan and they break free. But unfamiliar with the incredible life that God has in store for them, they long for the old life. I've seen it over and over and over again. They come into contact with freedom, real freedom but they forget. How do they forget? They stop reading. If you ever read this book, I don't know how many times it is. I'll have to look it up sometime. How many times they referred back to the deliverance of Egypt? And how many times they talk about the Red Sea? And God opened up the Red Sea and we walked through on dry ground. That's the problem with this generation. We don't ever get together for fellowship and say, hey, <laughs> I used to be a drug addict, and God delivered me. I remember when I went in the baptistry. I'm telling you, when I came out, the chains were gone. I never picked up another cigarette. I never picked up another bottle of alcohol. I never drank another beer. Hallelujah. I was free. Instead, we say, where's the meat? Where's the next? What's this? Where's it? We need to talk about the testimonies of God. What has God done in your life and in mine? We have a remedy. We've been delivered. But we have a remedy for twice delivered. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Witnesses of what? Let me tell you about something. I was an addict, but I'm not anymore. I used to get used 15 shots 
of Yukon Jack before I took the stage, but I don't need it. I've never had one since I got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. You can be delivered, and I can be delivered. You need to be delivered again, but don't let your flesh take you away from God. You might have been saved, but we've got to stay at the foot of the cross. We've got to stay there and make and, and allow God to continue to deliver this sinful flesh, would you bow your heads with me, Jesus? Thank you for the incredible experiences that you've given us. Thank you for your blood that flowed from Calvary's Hill. Thank you for the stripes, the whips upon your back that you provided healing for us. Thank you for the word that provides direction. Thank you for your spirit that empowers us, gives us the ability to live for you, to live according to your word. But help us never forget, God, we were saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in your name. Lord, that's salvation. That's getting out of the old life and getting into the new. But nothing is guaranteed. That merely causes us to be born again of water and spirit but we've got to live from that day on for you because the Bible says to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto, unto salvation. Lord, we've got to be looking for you. We've got to be anticipating. We've got to be paying attention for your soon return, not distracted by the things of this world, by the sin of this world, not overcome with the influence of people, but we've got to be delivered from a place and we've got to be delivered from people that will drag us down, and we've got to be delivered from the penalty. Would you help us, Lord, to draw close to you this morning? I pray for that right now. These altars are open. I encourage you this morning to come and make sure that those rivers of living water are bubbling up from your well, or if the enemy possibly has filled it with dust and dirt, like the Philistines did to the well of Jacob. They dumped a bunch of rocks and mud so that Jacob so no, could no longer draw. The devil does that to us. He fills our wells with stones and rocks and mud and dirt and trash. And we got to say, God, I'm going to dig out that well because I want that clear, crisp living water flowing in my life. Come and take a drink this morning. I encourage you to take a drink from the living water of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's worship. Jesus. 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 That's it. You know as well as I, since I was saved, I have failed God. But oh God, oh God, I need your power this morning. I need your blood to wash over my life again. I need your forgiveness. Jesus. Strength like no other reaches to me. 